What's going on guys? Welcome back to the YouTube channel. Once again, my name is Drew Seipert, sole proprietor of Bandito and Prepare right here in Lubbock, Texas. Today we have a recap restoration of a 1965 Fender Champ, a very early CBS. I'm looking at the date codes here and we've got 13th week of 65. We got a combination of uh, the post CBS uh, silver face brown turds right here, but we also have uh, one molded cap, so this is very much a transitional amplifier. All original, so we're going to be giving it a full recap and we're going to be changing out the power cord and redoing the mains primary wiring to be up to modern standards. This is going to be a pretty simple one, uh, but I do get to show you how I pull out multi-section can capacitors, which can be a bit tricky, but if you have a great big old soldering iron like this, it goes pretty smoothly. So let's get started with that multi-section capacitor. All right, so here's what this multi-section can capacitor looks like on the inside. Before we do anything, we're gonna go ahead and remove all of these uh, leads going to the three 20 UF capacitors. We'll just kind of bend them up out of the way. Um, we, I think you can kind of take a mental image of this. They're all 20 UF capacitors, so really it doesn't, I don't think it really matters which ones go where as far as that's concerned. Uh, then we're going to take our giant soldering iron and we're going to wick up the solder against the chassis here. And we are going to be going back in with a CE manufacturing uh, multi-section can capacitor. You can get this off of Tube Depot, um, Antique Electronic Supply, which is my primary supplier. One. One thing I will say about multi-section can capacitors is just be prepared to use a lot of solder wick. Before you get started, it's useful to kind of tin up the end of your giant soldering iron a little bit. Get yourself a good length of wick. Set it down on top and you just kind of want to pull the wick through that puddle just like that all right so i'm going to go ahead and yank these old leads off to get them out of my way makes it a little easier to get the soldering iron in there and we know we're not going to be reusing this filter cap anyhow there we go sometimes they're pains sometimes they come up pretty easy but you always get one a lot of times I don't see all four tacked down. Sometimes it's just two, which is a lot easier, but it's what we're seeing today. Turn up the iron again. All right. All right, I saved the worst for last one that's got the biggest freaking glob on it. So let's see about getting it all wicked up. Now here comes the fun part, the part that I actually do somewhat enjoy, which is a technique that I call mopping. I probably did not invent this, but I figured it out for myself. And that's where you take a fresh bit of solder wick, you put it underneath your iron, and you just kind of move around and hoover up all that extra solder on the interior chassis here. Just scrubbing it a little bit with the solder wick and it gets all of that old solder up. Gives you a nice clean surface to work with whenever you're putting the new one in. Looks really good there. Have a look there guys, look how clean that looks.
Got to switch hands here. I'm normally left-handed, but got to be able to get this giant iron down inside the chassis. All right, so we got our leads popped back in. We are done with our giant 100 watt soldering iron. So we can go ahead and turn that off. I, I like to power my 100 watt soldering iron with the Variac back here. Um, just allows me to have at least some kind of control on the temperature. That's, so that's kind of nice. Alright guys, so next we are going to change out all of these cathode bypass capacitors. We are going in with the Sprague 25 at 25. Here we have instances where the, the leads on these capacitors, which were very long from factory, double as our connection to chassis. So instead of dragging out the entire capacitor, what I like to do is to snip it real close like that. Go ahead and heat it up and bend the, the rest of that lead down on the side of the eyelet and give yourself enough room to put that new capacitor in place. Alrighty guys, the recap is finished and now we're gonna go ahead and take care of our new power cord and redo the primary wiring, take out that death cap and uh, we'll see you when we're finished with that. Going to put a ground lug on one of these posts for our new ground wire. Alrighty, guys, everything's done now. We got all new wiring on the mains primary and all the caps have been changed. Let's go ahead and bring this thing up on the Variac, send a signal through it and monitor back on the benchtop test set. All right guys, we're sitting at 40 volts on the mains primary on our Variac machine. We're gonna go ahead and take a gator clip, clip one of the ends, the black end of our multimeter here and clip it to chassis and then we're gonna test our secondary voltage, I'm seeing 160 volts on one of those caps, 158, 156, 155. So we are passing voltage now. We're going to keep bringing up that voltage on the Variac. All right, so it's 60 volts. Start to pass signal through the test set.
good sign, guys. Alrighty guys, we're running at 125 volts, and just like the last one, I thought it's always cool to kind of show you what the breakup looks like. There you go, there's that distorted waveform. Now I don't know how useful um, this demonstration is, but it does look cool. All right guys, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our multimeter, uh, a pen, paper, and a calculator, and we're going to check the bias on the 6V6 output tube of this Champ and make sure that everything is running nice and smooth. All right, we got a negative 10.8 voltage drop across the transformer. I'm gonna divide that by the ohms of the transformer, 286.3 and multiply that times the plate voltage, 426. We are getting a plate dissipation of 16.06 watts. It's running very hot, very typical. Fender Champs just run hot. We're gonna go ahead and change out that cathode resistor on the 6V6 to get this thing running a little bit cooler. So here's a few resistors I like to keep on hand for Fender Champs. We get quite a few of these little guys in here. I like to keep a 500 ohm, a 680, and a 750 on hand. Now stock, the Fender Champ has a 470 ohm resistor and I have never seen one that is running um, anything less than 100% and most of the time they're running over 100% on the plate dissipation. So we're gonna be trying to get it down to that that sweet spot of between 65 and 85, or 60 and 85, uh, and these resistors will typically get you there. Although I will say, I, I did see Colleen uh, Fazio's video where she did a Fender Champ that wound up needing uh, a 1K ohm resistor in that place. Uh, I don't typically keep that one on hand for Champs. Um, up until that point, I'd never seen that before, so hopefully this gets us there. If we need to get something bigger, we may have to run to the store. Of course, as always, we want to go ahead and discharge those capacitors before we do any work, now that we know we've powered it up. All right, we're shooting for the fences here. We're going with that 750 ohm resistor. We're gonna go ahead and retest that bias and see where we're setting. All right, so we did our math and unfortunately we're still sitting at 13.1, which is like, uh, it's like 90% of max. It's still just a little too high. I do have one last trump card. That is a metal oxide five watt resistor. It's rated at 820. Let's cross our fingers that we break that 80% of max threshold. All right, so that 820 ohm resistor brought our plate dissipation down to 12.32, which is 87% of max. It's really close, guys, uh, but Fender Champs run hot. Uh, they're kind of notorious for that. I really think we're, we're at a safe percentage here. Also given consideration that this amp has an original uh, RCA tube in it that's been running at 16 watts for who knows how many years, I think this is a major improvement and this amp is going to be running very good for a very long time. We're taking a lunch break. Went and got myself some Dairy Queen. Okay, so I am from Texas. I'm a Whataburger guy, right? Whataburger is better than In-N-Out. We all know this. But secretly, every West Texan knows that once you're west of Abilene, it's Dairy Queen. Cold hard facts. Let's pull out the SM57 and do a sound check.